Hi everyone, I'm Terry Modisette. I'm the Executive Director of the Centre for Legal Innovation at the College of Law and really delighted to welcome you to or welcome you back to, as the case may be, the uh, Legal Automation mini-series, which is part of our Digital Literacy Series. I'm absolutely delighted today to welcome Evan Wong, um, who, uh, as you will see shortly, because I'll do a little bit of an intro of themselves, is the CEO and co-founder of Checkbox. We've been really fortunate to have Checkbox as one of our key collaborators uh, in bringing this mini series to you. And thank you, Evan and Checkbox very much um, for your support and, and in making uh, this possible. And Evan's joined today by Alex Rosenroch. Alex is uh, also an amazing person. You'll probably know him from his Legal Ops podcast. But today um, he is uh, here as a manager of PwC New Law, and we're really divided, delighted to have uh, him here as well. The topic today is a really important one. It's episode uh, four in this series, but the focus on building the business case for legal automation is obviously something that is key, uh, whatever your automation project is, and really there are no better people to take you through this uh, than Evan and Alex. And so <clears throat> thank you, folks, again. You're most welcome. Thank you to everyone for joining us, thank and I'm going to hand over to Evan and yeah. Alex. Thanks again, folks. Thanks, Terry. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and welcome, everyone. As Terry said, we're on episode four now of the automation series. This one's all about building the business case for legal automation. Uh, as a bit of a test, taste tester, um, we're going to be covering sort of how to actually quantify benefit, you know, the other elements of benefit that may not be quantifiable. We'll be walking through really the uh, structure of a business case, how to handle objections as well. Um, and I'm really, really excited to have Alex join me today, um, a good friend of mine now. And um, this is a conversation that you and I, Alex, have had many times before. And I remember that, um, uh, I remember back when you used to work at uh, Telstra in the legal ops role there, you used to send me texts telling me that you wouldn't wake up for anything less than 200% ROI. So I think um, we'll definitely be visiting that uh, throughout this presentation. So pleasure to have you here with me. Yeah, also be here, Evan. Awesome. So we'll, we'll kind of do quick introductions first, get that out of the way, and then we'll, we'll dive right into the content. Um, so my name is Evan Wong. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Checkbox. If you haven't heard of Checkbox before, we're a no-code legal automation platform. It means that we help legal teams of all sizes um, be able to scale the delivery of legal services using drag and drop, things like document automation, intake and triage, and automated advice and approval processes. Um, and we've now grown from being a headquartered Australian company to one that operates uh, very globally. So I'm quite proud uh, to be able to uh, lead that organization. Alex, what about yourself? Mm. Yeah, so Alex is my name. So I'm, a, as, as Terry said, a manager at PwC New Law. So at, at New Law, we focus on kind of transformation of in-house teams, but more broadly, the transformation of the legal industry, which is no mean feat. Um, just a really quick cap on, on my background. So lawyer by background, cut my teeth as, as a lawyer, kind of at Telstra back in the day, then rolled into legal operations role there um, and have really been implementing legal technology um, and kind of working in the legal operations space for like close to four years now. So quite a lot of tech implementations on my belt. And you and I have been on the same side of the table, opposite sides of the table. Um, and we've been through a lot of those journeys together. Absolutely. Yeah, so I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. In fact, maybe we can start with, you know, just, just starting from the very beginning here. Um, what is business case, right, Alex, from your experience and, and why is it important? You know, because I, I feel like there's, there's, there's definitely the, um, there's the people in, in, in the audience who may think, well, if, if something obviously makes sense, let's just go and do it. Why need to go through the, the, the effort of building a business case? Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's a good place to kind of ground us. And I mean, it's, it, it is what it says on the tin, right? It's just a case to be able to push forward with your transformation, in this case, automation journey. And really what it helps you um, answer is, well, is this actually worth pursuing? You know, it, it, if something is a problem, is it worth necessarily solving that problem? And it's, it's a really simple equation to think about, is the effort worth the outcome? Is the effort worth the, the benefit? Um, the other thing I like to think about is it kind of makes you force you to think about your return on investment. If, if you haven't really grounded yourself in what the business case is, then you probably haven't really understood what the problem is. So then 
if you implement something or change something, like how do you know you're done? Like how do you know you've succeeded? And you will always be kind of chasing that kind of continuous magical initiative that never really ends because you actually haven't really defined what it is you're looking to solve. Um, I think it's also about kind of engaging your stakeholders and making sure that everyone is on the same page about A, the effort involved and kind of B, what the outcome is going to be. Um, when you look at like project management statistics, one of the biggest um, issues with uh, project management is actually delivering the wrong thing. And that equally mm. aqu- a- applies to business cases. You know, if we're going to put a lot of effort into something, we want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So it's multifaceted, but like I said, it, in a simple concept, it's really just um, you know, getting getting enough resources to deliver the transformation you're looking to deliver. Yeah, absolutely. And and what I've found as well is, I've, you know, we've we've seen many projects where um, you might have a champion who's super excited about transformation, the automation project. They take it really far. There's a lot of momentum, but then it hits sort of the part in the process where you're now asking for money or sign off from senior stakeholders, and they haven't been part of the journey. So for them, it's like really difficult for them to, to, to believe in, 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 the, in the potential. And often the business case I see as being the bridge to, to be able to bring everyone in, as you, as you were saying, it's really that broader mm. group of stakeholders. And um, um, one, one concept I like to think about as well is, and I talked to, to you about this the other day, is this, this concept around organizational psychology, right? Where, <laughs> you know, um, I think there's a lot of people in organization and if everyone went off and just made decisions, you know, some will be right and many of them will be wrong. Um, and a business case is almost a way to prove that you've gone through the process that you have, in fact, um, put in the due diligence of um, to taking a collective decision-making approach in order to get to the right outcome, right? And, and it's very much trust in the collective rather than trust in, in a specific person um, to be able to, um, to drive these, uh, these, these projects through. And I think the business case is almost like a, a material form of, of that, that's really important to get that buy-in at a, at a group level. Mm, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it's kind of like, put your money where your mouth is, like it's kind of proving it. And, you know, you might as an individual, like you said, say that this is going to provide benefits, it's going to provide cost savings, it's going to provide efficiencies. But I mean, mm. that might be your optimism speaking. And I, I definitely suffer from what I call millennial bias. I always have optimism <laughs> bias. And it kind of puts you in check as well. It's like, okay, well, you know, if we are looking to, to get those efficiencies, how do we actually quantify that um, to make sure that, I, again, you're, you're delivering what you said you're going to deliver? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Um, great. Well, I think in terms of understanding the, the, the business case, um, the purpose of it is it's pretty clear. Um, you know, it's really important. And whilst it may not feel like it's necessary, you know, it helps you kind of remove a lot of those barriers um, further downstream. But I want to get into kind of the heart of it as well, of, of a business case, um, because as you said earlier on, it's really about building that ROI. And I think um, particularly within the legal team, we're not, you know, daily procurers of technology and, and sort of transformation projects. And so even the concept of how do I calculate an ROI for what typically is a manual process with very little data looking into quantifying benefit for the future can be pretty challenging, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I want to I want to kind of go back into showing my slides for a second and really um, dive into sort of how ROI is calculated from a very quantitative point of view. Um, and then we can kind of jump back into kind of the qualitative aspects as well. So for those of you who have kind of never um, calculated ROI before, this is the kind of formula for it. Um, we've actually gone here and uh, modified the ROI equation specifically for automation. Right, so specifically for automation. So um, this might look daunting because there's a lot of stuff on, a, on an equation and maybe you haven't looked at <laughs> these types of things since high school maths. I know I rarely look at this stuff nowadays, but, um, but let's walk through it really quickly. Right. So really, if we just break it down, it's pretty simple. Um, when you look at automation, it's, it's typically about sort of how do you make these existing processes, these interactions um, more streamlined, more better. And the first thing that you look at is time. It's really how long does it take to actually do this task? Is it five hours? Is it um, two days, right? And frequency is how often you do that. Yes, it's five hours, but is it five hours once a year? Is it five hours once a month, once a week, once a day, right? Um, And it's even how many people are working on it in terms of frequency. It might be once a day for one lawyer or once a day for 10 lawyers, right? 
Then you have the cost element, which is really around, um, well, what is the dollar figure translation of that time times frequency? So let's say if your you know, legal headcount costs, say $50 an hour, then it's $50 times five hours per day times five lawyers, right? So that's kind of building up effectively what is the cost of that activity today. And that's really the before component. But often what people um, don't factor in is really the after, right? Because I think a lot of the times when we think about the pain point, um, we think about how much it's costing us today and then we magically think that it's going to become zero due to automation. But that's not true. As you would know, uh, Alex, you know, often automation doesn't completely remove the cost or the time factor. It may just you know, partially reduce it. And so we want to look at actually the time frequency and cost of the after state as well. And that difference will effectively give you the total benefit, right? Um, then we also got to factor in the cost of investment. So this would be like, your, um, like the cost of your technology that you might be purchasing to benefit this, uh, to realize these benefits, like right? the license fees. And, and, and really then the last component, uh, sorry, the top component together there is really the net benefit. So it's like your total benefit minus the cost to get that benefit is your net benefit. And then when you go and multiply that by 100%, over cost of investment, that just gives you the percentage, right? You phrase yeah. ROI in percentage. Yeah, awesome. So, so what I want to do is kind of go through an example, right? I'm going to test you a little bit as well, Alex, if that's okay. Mm, good. Please. <laughs> awesome. So, so to put that in perspective, right? Let's pretend we got Sally. Sally's, you know, doing you know legal operations in a in a legal team. She's going to purchase an automation tech that costs like twenty five thousand dollars. Right? That's a license fee per annum. The before state, she went and she spoke with the team and found out that it takes about three lawyer hours to create a particular service agreement that she's trying to automate. They do about 240 of these a year and they have a headcount of like $90 an hour within this, within this um, in-house team, right? The after state is they're going to reduce three to 0 0.5. They're going to bring, uh, well, 240 stays the same because that automation shouldn't change the number that they do um, and, and the cost is still the same, right? So when we look at the formula here, um, maybe Alex, you can help us walk us through. Like, what, what's the what's the kind of yeah? Let's let's do this. Well, so have we? So time. How 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 much time does Sally spend on these contracts? Yeah. Well, in this case, she's previously spending three hours. Um, now she's going to spend zero point five. Yeah. Yep. So so we have time. We have frequency, cool. which is three. You know, two hundred and forty. We have the cost, which is $90 per hour, which would be like an internal headcount cost. It would just be a number that they could calculate themselves. Do that calculation the same as after, minus the cost of an investment, which is $25,000 over the cost of an investment times 1,000, which will get you an ROI, which hopefully is more than 400%. Otherwise, I'm not getting out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's, let's crunch the numbers and let's, let's crunch the numbers and have a look. So you're exactly right. Um, and, and it's funny because people probably think that we, like that I prepped you for this, but I did not. Like I'm just putting no, you on no. the spot right now. I'm, I'm improvising. It was good. Yeah, yeah, it was good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but luckily you got it right. You got it right. So, yeah. so you, you crunch the numbers, and it comes out at 116. percent So it looks like for you, Alex, you're not getting out of bed today for this. <laughs> for this, <laughs> um, but 116 percent ROI obviously is um, a, a, a net positive ROI, and overall this project yeah. is a good idea. But, but, but I've got another test for you. Got another test. Mm. So there's actually something missing here, right? Like, like in terms of the data for the before and after that we put into this formula, right? There's, there's some elements that we, that we re were remiss to kind of consider. And these are very common things that when calculating ROI, teams tend to forget. So can you have a guess as to what might be missing here? <laughs> there's, there's a few things going through my mind actually. So from an investment perspective, we consider what they call CapEx. In most organizations, licensing costs would be CapEx, but there's always an OpEx investment as well. So your kind of operational expenditure will look like a big spike at the start and then kind of drop off completely towards the end. So I think the, the fallacy there is that um, when you're calculating your investment, you do need to calculate your total investment. So if we are considering that $90 per hour to be how much a lawyer is is how much a lawyer costs that organization and that lawyer specifically is also going to be spending time in doing this, then you'll probably have to calculate that calculation in your investment as well. Is that right? Did I get that right? Nailed it. Nailed it. Yes. Wait. Um, <laughs> no prep. Exactly. And, and I feel like a lot of people do forget, as you say, right? Like they, they factor in yeah. the cost of the license and the technology, but then they forget it takes time. 
and time is money and, and, and time is effort, right? It's opportunity cost. And a lot of the times it isn't factored here. Um, and it's not just mm -hmm. lawyers because, you know, sometimes you have the lawyer component feeding in as, you know, the partner to the technology, the subject matter expert, but there's also costs that might go into change management, right? Um, uh, that, that, that needs to be factored in. So you're exactly right. That's one of the two things that I've purposely missed out here. What's the, what's the second thing that, that, <laughs> that, I, that I missed out? Well, Can you guess what it is? It, it, it could be this, and this is something that I'm actually dealing with right now. And, and that is really the return on investment calculation doesn't stop at the specific use case. If you think about um, what is actually going to be um, realized in terms of benefit for this, you're going to have time back. Now, you can say mm. we've saved, I'll pull a number out, let's, let's say it's 200 hours per, per year. Now, that could, you could stop there, and that's where a lot of teams have stopped previously. But that's only half the conversation. If you could say that those 200 hours that traditionally spent on, let's just call it low value, low, um, low value, low risk work, are now high value, high risk work, then there is a material benefit in those 200 hours, hours as well. And that 200 hours could calculate to, let's say, reducing your external spend, which you know, an average lawyer might charge, let's say, $600 an hour. So now all of a sudden that number is, is, a, is a lot bigger. But also the benefit in terms of that opportunity cost could be a lot higher because you're now spending time, like I said, on, on higher value stuff. So whilst you've kind of dipped yourself in terms of your return on investment calculation because you've now had to calculate your capital or your OPEX in relation to implementing it, you've increased your return on investment because you've actually got the full end-to-end -end return on investment calculation because you've realized the benefit from that saving. Absolutely. Is that the answer? <laughs> it is. It is. So you're exactly okay, right. Cause, good. Because I've missed out on two things here. One is, as you say, it's under. It's almost under um, accounting for the cost of investment. But on the other side, on the flip side, we've also under accounted for the the actual benefit itself for the reasons you mentioned. And the other thing is also the benefit back to the business because mm. how this has been phrased so far is this is the time saving for the legal team, right? Multiplied by the legal team sort of cost. Um, but what about the business team what if by simplifying this process you know the business user goes from spending an hour in self-serving like a template off the intranet portal and struggling with that and doing phone calls and emails back to the legal team to clarify right down to you know maybe it is zero for the business user right that mm -hmm. is another chunk of saving so you're exactly right and so if we adjust for that if you look behind the curtain and I'm making these numbers up maybe there's another 20,000 in human cost to maintain to implement for change management the, the elements that you mentioned. And then there's also the cost savings by the on the business side as well. And you can see now the, the numbers have changed. It's gone down in my example, 57%. So now you're really stuck in a coma. You're, not, you're really not gonna get out of bed. Um, but um, <laughs> you know, these are just examples, but it's important to be able to take that holistic approach when looking at ROI that, that may not be as obvious um, for people who just like, you know, might Google ROI, how to calculate ROI. Yeah. These are the things that come out because there's nuances to, to legal teams and automation projects. And it comes with experience. I think um, <laughs> that you and I have seen plenty of these uh, examples before. Yeah, no, it's definitely a great call out. And I'd probably just go a little bit further with the business side of things as well, because it's not necessarily just time for the business. It could be frequency. So that 240 service agreements per year was capped because that's how much the legal team could support. But all of a sudden, you've got a, a tool now that can do it 24-7 and those account execs can do it at 1 a.m. if they wanted to. And all of a sudden, they're pumping out 500 service agreements. And that has now related directly to you know, their KPIs or related directly to, I don't know, the revenue of the organization as well if they're sales agreements. So all of a sudden you're contributing to, you know, the company strategy and, you know, increasing its revenue or whatever KPI. So there's kind of those. The other thing I, I'd probably also just mention um, is around specifically those numbers and the numbers I actually use to calculate return on investment. Now there's, there's lots of research in this space. Clock have a great, some great numbers and the ACC have some great numbers. Generally it sits around $260 per hour uh, US for an internal headcount. Now, whilst you can do your own calculation, what you should be considering is not just, um, you know, salary costs, for instance, but it's fully loaded, right? It's, it's everything. Mm. It's that fully, mm. fully loaded. And, you know, by all the accounts in the US, as well as some of the research that is done here, it generally sits around $260 per hour for an internal resource. That's a pretty safe bet to use. I think you, you're underbaking yourself there with $70 <laughs> per hour. And like I said, I, it, they're, they're, that's the kind of number that I've been using in a lot of the business cases that I've been doing. In terms of, um, you know, external spends, you know, I think whilst that's a little bit harder to get, it's very simple to get from your e-billing system. If you were to just look at 
all of your rates across timekeepers and get a blended rate mm. and then use that blended rate. You know, it sits probably anywhere from 400 to maybe $600 if you're here in Australia around that. And you can use that to calculate your reduction in external spend. Again, not forgetting that that reduction in external spend is an opportune cost, which then you can use that dollar for something that is a lot more valuable. So that dollar for dollar is not a dollar for dollar anymore. It's maybe dollar for five dollars. So don't forget that. Nailed it. Absolutely. In fact, you have passed the final test because I was going to ask you one last thing here, which yeah. is that the, the, net, the, the net benefit part of the equation at the top doesn't have to be based on time saving. And you've already started to, to kind of jump into that, right? Because the, mm. the example that we just went through is like a pure time saving type ROI calculation. But there are many other examples where the net benefit doesn't have to be that. And, and, and you just mentioned one, right? Like I know that, you know, you and I have talked before as to you know, if you do ROI calculations and you save um, time internally, that's not necessarily a green dollar saving unless you're literally reducing headcount because of this project. But you can, in fact, get those green dollar savings when you look at reducing external spend, right? Um, if you can bring some of that external sort of spend work back internally because of automation and you get those sort of um, the, the kind of unit economics through automation, it makes sense. But, but have you seen any other sort of... Um, examples of what, what might sit at the top that substitute time saving? Yeah, there's a few things at play here. And, and maybe just to briefly explain green dollar, if, if people aren't familiar with that mm. kind of concept. So there's, it, there's a concept of green dollars and blue dollars. And I got this from my old manager, Denise Dole, shout out. And you know, green dollars are actual numbers that you, know, you can physically save at, at your bottom line. So it's, it's a number that you've actually saved because of external spend costs or because you're reducing, say, the types of technology that you have, or in some cases, you're reducing the operating cost of the team, so you remove headcount. So there are actual dollars that are saved. Blue dollars are a little bit harder to calculate because that's the opportune cost. So if we have relieved 200 hours, but we aren't going to relieve that, or, um, realize that benefit from reducing headcount, we're actually going to say you can now reutilize that time for, say, high strategic work. And that becomes a more arbitrary number because it's it's an opportune cost. So you've got your green, which is, I think, a lot more powerful in most organizations, and then your blue, which can be a little bit harder to kind of get across the line from a um, business case perspective. But as I'm starting to work with a lot more clients around the world, what I'm finding is that whilst there are some teams that are under financial pressures, there are other teams that have completely different drivers. And not to say that there's aren't there's no financial pressures because everyone has that, but it's not the main driver. And, you know, for some organizations, they're thinking about, and to your question, Evan, things like risk mitigation. So perhaps, you know, their GC is quite nervous because the company has, say, expanded really quickly and they're trying to reduce risk because the account execs mm -hmm. are just pumping out, say, service agreements left, right and center. And we want to make sure that mm -hmm. we're doing a standardized approach to, say, just contract generation, which is something Checkbox can absolutely help with. But then you've got things like standardization. So let's go on the other end of the spectrum where you're a very large organization and you've grown, say, quite quickly and you've got pockets of different processes. And because of those different processes, you've got risks and all those other things. So perhaps it's around process standardization. Um, there's also things like NPS, client satisfaction. You know, may maybe the, the team has... Um, but sorry, the business users have a, a poor perception of the legal team because of speed or because of risk aversion or, or whatever it may be. And your KPI that you're measuring there is NPS. Um, the other point is around kind of this more sentinel thing, I guess, around like building a new capability. Like you can't underestimate hmm. the value in actually creating a new skill for the team. You think about the, the competency or the capability of your legal team being you know, A to B, which is traditionally what a legal team has done, but actually transforming that to be A, B, and now C, which is around you know, innovation, um, automation, and those kind of things. Again, it's a little bit harder to calculate a physical number on that, but I think most organizations that I've seen have been thinking about how do we upskill our workforce? And as knowledge workers, that's what we need to focus on because that is our tool, right? Our tool is knowledge. And if we can add new tools to our toolkit, we become... I, I, like I said, a, a much stronger team, legal team. Mm, absolutely. And, and I love that concept at the end that you're talking there about building capability because it, I think the industry feels this, right? Like they, they know that, that there, is a, there is, you know, the do more with less is overused, but it's because there's an increase in complexity due to, you know, um, the volatility of the market at the moment, you know, the, the growth in regulatory Type, type of complexities, but the head counts aren't growing. And so whilst, you know, keeping your head down, 
grinding through contracts and legal advice and all that kind of stuff has worked for us painfully to this point. It's like, how do we actually scale and build the future legal department, right? Like, how do we build one that's actually scalable, where each each person in the team is actually being able to service more? And I think it's it's not something that a technology can solve, right, just by purchasing it overnight. It's, it's very much, as you say, it's a muscle that is, you know, trained and developed, and it's a capability that needs to be, you know, um, um, created through, you know, starting projects in automation, because mm-hmm. you've got to start somewhere to, to start building that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And to like visually represent that, I mean, if you think about your operational, so your OPEX and your CAPEX, like it, it's going to look quite bumpy at the start, right? So your, mm. your graph is going to be high and then drop off, but your return on investment should start low and then increase. And that's yeah. because of that capability. And we've, we've really just shown the example of um, one specific app, but as we know, Checkbox provides a capability. So you might have one app in year one, in year two, you might have 10 apps. And then there is a mm-hmm. massive spike in return on investment because you're getting that constant reinforcement of the technology, but also using the technology to build new apps. So then your kind of trajectory of um, your return on investment is just increasing exponentially almost each year. And you can't forget about that as well in terms of your calculation. Yeah, that's very true, actually, because often automation isn't just a single use case. So that's why a lot of the providers in the market tend to be a platform play, not an off-the-shelf solution, right? Like you don't go and buy an NDA automation tool. You tend to buy mm-hmm. a tool that allows you to automate your NDA, but also your service agreements, but also your share trading window advice and, and all, the, all the like, right? And so you're saying that you can kind of compound the ROI um, for the same cost of investment or one that scales faster than the cost of investment um, through, through capability. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's it's the analogy I'm thinking. It's the reason why Lego is so like successful. It's like you can you buy one pack and you can build heaps of toys, right? <laughs> you know, you keep definitely kept me kept me excited for years because you could just yeah, keep, keep building stuff. So fun analogy. Yeah. Absolutely, awesome. Um, and and on the note of sort of um, uh, you're you're talking about you're kind of moving into almost like non quantitative um ROI, right? Because you were talking about standardization and and um, and sort of risk mitigation. I see a lot of these as almost strangely enough, you know, we, we work with a customer who um, they also didn't necessarily look at the, the, the kind of confines of a formula or, or, or like a ROI figure. They looked at the risk element and for them, um, it was around sort of data incident, right? And that was a very big deal for them. And it was like a board level consideration. And that in mm-hmm. itself, the risk that came with that, like the weight of that risk that came with that use case, was enough to justify the ROI. So you're, you're absolutely right. It doesn't have to be numbers. You can look for strategic alignment in terms of you know, building, building a business case for, for, for automation as well. Um, I'll give you an interesting, I'll give you a very different kind of example as well from, from my experiences. We also had another customer before where um, they were a very values-driven organization and um, using automation and, and sort of across their legal and procurement and, and it's really their contract lifecycle management, that they could actually bake in a lot of the controls that map to like their CSR, their, their concepts of um, women-led enterprises, modern slavery, right? Like all these different concepts they, they could actually bake in. And part of the ROI was not, again, just numbers, but actually how they could further their actual um, corporate values. Um, how they could just not talk the talk, but literally walk the walk in the way they operationalize them through automation. Um, so there's so many different angles depending on what resonates with the stakeholders and what matters to your business that that you you can get pretty creative about. Hmm. Yeah, look, and look, the, the challenge is some of those thinking around like there's a difference between number-led business case and say qualitative business case is hmm. that in my mind, everything can be converted into a number. Um, it's a bit of a challenge, but everything is possible. And the way that I frame this is if something matters, it can be observed. Mm. And if it can be observed, it can be measured in an amount or a range of amounts. So you know, if we take something that's really complicated, like risk, for instance, um, there's many different ways in which you can kind of calculate that. But you know, a pretty simple way is to think about your you know, risk enterprise framework. There's always things like impact and likelihood. And, you know, if, if something is, if the likelihood of something is, is happening, so the likelihood of something happening is quite low, but the impact is quite high, then what is the impact? Is the impact $2 million? Is it $5 million? And you can really draw a nexus between, well, if mm. we, in our current mode of operation, our likelihood is X, 
And therefore, you know, if we if, if that materializes, then we have to pay $2 million. But if we introduce our application, now our likelihood is a lot lower. Now that the impact doesn't change, but the likelihood does change. And you can still draw a calculation between that. You know, it might be reducing your likelihood by two points, for instance. That's a number that I tell you that the board's going to care about. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then you can you can you convert things like satisfaction into NPS, right? That's a pretty common yeah. way, or it could even just be another satisfaction. So I think anyone that says, you know, it's not a dollar figure and therefore can't be measured, just just check that and say yeah. mm. to yourself, well, if it actually matters, it can be observed. And if it can be observed, it can be measured in an amount or a range of amounts. You just have to find it and be creative sometimes. That's that's really good advice. And I think um, even even for the risk point, I mean, you're talking about here the likelihood, likelihood versus impact kind of matrix, but you know, you could even take a different angle and, and think about, well, if it's driven by, you know, regulator, regulatory regime, you know, are there penalties involved? What's the probability yeah. and what's the size of the penalty? And again, you can mm-hmm. translate those into doll- into into effectively numbers, right? It's like, I don't know, 15% chance of, of, of $2 million fine equals, and then you, you get a, you get an actual dollar figure. Um, so yeah, you're right. You, you just need to kind of think a bit deeper and, and be a bit sort of creative as to um, how you can quantify what is seemingly qualitative uh, benefits yeah. mm. and like don't don't stress over a specific amount just given a range like you mm. might say what is the absolute lowest number that we can reduce this by and then what's the maximum that we can reduce this by and the amount of data points that you can get to bring that range as you know short as possible then do it but if your range is quite large then that's fine i mean any any kind of number is better than no number don't get fixated on a specific number provide a range if, if you're not super confident absolutely Cool. Now we've we've talked a lot about kind of the benefits now and pulling together the quantitative and the qualitative. Um, but as you and I know, even if you get that right, you may not still be able to produce a very successful or effective business case. So often um, it's about how you frame a lot of those benefits. It's how about it's, it's about how you frame the business case. So do you have some kind of tips um, around how you might be able to to do that? Interpretive dance. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Mime it out. Um, yeah. Look, I think um, what I've learned recently by working with lots of different organizations is that you need to be obsessed with understanding the capital prioritization process of your organization. You know, like you said, right at the start, legal don't really do this on a day-to-day basis. They're probably only doing this every couple of years for their very large investments. So they're not used to the internal procurement process. They're not used to the software procurement process, those kind of things. And what I, what I, what I, what I found is that if you take a traditional approach to return on investment, um, you may miss what the company actually cares about in terms of prioritization. So for instance, a client that I'm currently working with, they have kind of categories of prioritization. And for this particular organization, the number one thing that will get you capital is safety. It's not reducing mm. headcount, it's not reducing costs, it's increasing safety. So when you're creating your business case, it's thinking, well, what part of whatever I'm bringing to the table is going to tick whatever the prioritization matrix is. So get obsessed with understanding that. In some organizations, it's quite sophisticated. They will have their own business case process and probably their own business case template. But all I would say is that it's about being creative in the way in which you match your business case to what their business case requirements are for your organization. And if it's, you know, safety, focus on that. If it's not safety and if it's um, risk reduction, focus on that and so on and so forth. So just know the game you're playing <laughs> is probably the best way of saying it. Yeah. And what I liked about everything you just mentioned is it, it had nothing, like you were very business focused, right? And I, and I see mm-hmm. a lot of legal teams when they first start um, embarking on these journeys of trying to get budget, trying to um, build a business case for automation or for technology in general, they tend to be too inwards facing. Like they're thinking about mm-hmm. how does the legal team, you know, these are the problems of the legal team. We need to, you know, we need to bring in this technology to solve these problems for us. But in fact, there are a lot of, um, you know, the people that you tend to speak to to get to get sign off aren't from the legal team. They're the CFO, they're the, the, the VP of, I don't know, commercial or, or whatever it may be. So um, the ability to really, as you say, know the game within your organization and speak to that um, is really important. Um, yeah. It, it, yeah. Absolutely. 
and and it's funny because you can be you can be quite um like if, even if we take automation aside right like if, if we take another very common type of technology in legal like a document management system uh, i love to always give this, give this example because you know a dms seemingly is very internally focused for the legal team you know better filing um, and managing your documents um and it just makes your life easier but how do you actually therefore twist that and sell that to a business user because you being able to you know, file your stuff better um, isn't going to really resonate much with someone who doesn't do that, uh, do your job day to day. Um, you know, just go use SharePoint or go and use uh, <laughs> Dropbox that we already use. Like why spend more money on it, on another technology, right? And it's when you start to explain it as, you know, if we have this, we can actually manage your SLAs. When you go and request a, a contract, we can get that back to you, not in a day, but in, you know, five minutes. And you can progress deals faster and close more deals. And to your point, not 240 a year, but 400 a year because that bottleneck from the legal team is, is no longer there. That then starts to really resonate with, with your business stakeholders. Yeah, I mean, it's simply like, why should the business care? Like, I mean, you think mm -hmm. about it, legal are a cost center, generally one of the largest cost centers as well, um, because you've got a large legal spend, for instance. In, in most organizations, when you're looking at um, like professional services costs and legal 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 costs. Obviously, it's sitting in the legal team. So you're already an expensive business. You're a bit of a black hole to the rest of the business as well because it's like, well, we don't really know what legal does. You know, it costs us X million dollars a year because we have to have it, I guess. So, you know, they're not really seeing the, business, the, the legal team as that. And this is obviously a generalization. As a, you know, business enabler, it's more of a table stakes. Like we need to have a legal team to be able to operate as a, as a business. So communicating in a language that actually the business cares about. It sounds really obvious and, and probably a lot of people on this call will probably understand that. But, but I think it's just really important to focus on the business case for the business, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. not for the legal team. And, and whilst like they're going to be interlocked and I think they're going to be related to each other, communicating in a way of, like you said, we're going to be able to meet, maybe SLAs is a bad example because I think you should probably be meeting SLAs regardless of asking for capital. There could be other reasons why not, but you know, let, let's say it's being able to generate more contracts hmm. or let's say, you know, as you expand your organization and let's say the organization has increased by 25% headcount each year for the last three years, but the legal team has stayed the same. That's a pretty obvious correlation if for us to be able to continue the support that the business demands we need more headcount for instance or it could be you know automation or, or whatever it may be so just communicating it in a way that the business understands communicating in a way that actually shows that you're contributing to their kpis or even better how does it actually match them to the, the, the strategy of the company like i said sometimes you have to be a little bit creative without being mm. cheeky in connecting legal technology um capital request for capital and the overall strategy of the company but where there's a will there's a way evan and i've been through it multiple times yep. now yeah um, we've, we've been successful in a lot of our business cases for clients and, and customers so we've seen it all yeah absolutely and and even just when you were just mentioning that around aligning with corporate strategy i, I couldn't agree more and that's mm. kind of how we started our relationship together right like it was kind of you know when you were working at your previous employer and um, you know, the, the strategy was very much around simplification and, and, um, and savings. And all of a sudden you, you, what you had like a, uh, a quarter, like a 25% reduction in, in headcount to meet that corporate strategy. Um, and then all yep. of a sudden you can align technologies like checkbox or other, other tech to, to, to being able to meet that need. So that, that just made it so much more compelling to, to get the business case in the budget. Yeah. Yeah. And actually that brings me to another point around like, what is your burning platform and does it exist? Mm. And do you have to create a burning platform? Because in the in the Telstra example, and there's a really good um, uh, case study on this, the ACC, when we won the value champion. So you can have a read of that. Um, and it, it kind of talks about this need for transformation because the you know Telstra as a as a company was moving to a tech company, right? So it was it was part of the T22 strategy, and they were looking to transform their business. Now, obviously, the legal team had to transform as well to be able to support that business and. There was a, a large scale thing, like you said, there was a 25% headcount reduction, but also we needed to take out about 15% of our operating costs. So mm. there was your burning platform. It was going to happen either way. And it was a situation where you are, we either transform or be transformed. And you know, being in a really awesome progressive legal team, well, you know, they decided to, to take that and say, we're going to do this ourselves. Now, 
being able to support a business that was, you know, slightly smaller but still had the same risks and issues and those kind of things meant that we're going to have less people to do arguably more work because we're in a transition period. So we had to basically fill that gap with automation and other things. And that's where Checkbox kind of came in. And that's where, um, <laughs> you know, Ev and I started started chatting. But that, what I would say, is is kind of burning platform-led transformation where I'm not going to say it's easy, but I'm going to say it's easier because it's obvious. We needed to transform. We had to reach certain numbers and there was just no way we we're going to do it with their current mode of operation. The other end of the spectrum is more like individual led innovation or individual led transformation where mm -hmm. you've got say a leadership or a general, you know, understanding that the way in which you're operating is, is okay. Right. It's, it's okay. And, and sure we can do a little bit better. Maybe we can save a little bit of external spend, or maybe we could be focusing on like a little bit more strategic work, but you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I think there are a lot of the questions that I get is, you know, I'm an individual lawyer in a team and I can see that there is an, an absolute opportunity here to automate 10, 20, 15, whatever percent of my job and therefore I can focus on more strategic work. What I'd say to that is you need to think about the incentives of the legal team. And mm. there are some things that are in your hands and there are some things that are, that are not. And unless the legal team is incentivized to do something differently or transform or reduce costs or whatever it's going to be, it's going to be a pretty hard journey. It's not impossible, but it's going to be a hard journey. Because if, if you can't link your effort as an individual contributor to the team to the incentive of your manager or the incentive of the legal team, so their KPIs or whatever else they're getting measured against, it's going to be pretty hard. So what I've kind of been coaching some clients that I'm working with is actually taking their leadership team or taking the broader leadership team on a journey to change their incentives, <laughs> figure mm. out what their incentives are, and actually turn the conversation around, hey, we need technology, to perhaps maybe we need to think about how we show value to the business. And once we start yeah. having that conversation and actually start quantifying what our value is, in inverted commas, to the business, they might say it's speed. And all of a sudden, the legal team's been thinking, oh, we we're trying to reduce risk and manage costs and all those kind of things. And the <laughs> business goes, actually, no, yeah. the thing I really want you to focus on is, is speed to contracts, for instance, which is a very common thing. So all of a sudden, oh, okay, I'm a, I'm a GC now and my incentive is helping my business, you know, do business. And if their KPI, they keep their, their KPI is speed, then all of a sudden I'm a GC thinking, I'm incentivized now to do this a little bit quicker. And that trickles down throughout the entire team. So my my advice to people that are coming up against a team or an organization that is kind of happy with the status quo, start having a conversation about how you measure the value of your team. It's a scary conversation to have, yeah. <laughs> but none of this is easy. Um, and, and I think that's that's where you, if you put a light if you put a light on it, then then things might happen. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And and um, it actually reminds. So we were on a roundtable recently with a whole bunch of GCs and chief legal officers, and um, one of the one of the people in the roundtable um, mentioned, "Look, things are fine. Like things are normal." Mm. And alluding to the point you're making, which is like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And another person in in the roundtable said, "But I, I don't agree. Like I think things are really broken. Actually, when you look at the way that you um, that legal like your legal team is operating right now, people are working." you know, ridiculous amount of hours just to stay on top of the work, to stay afloat. Um, and it's almost been normalized. Like it is normal to be overworked to, to, to do all these things. And, you know, this is just taking a different angle from what you're mentioning, which is, you know, speaking and understanding, you know, what is value to the business, but also just as a leader of, you know, legal functions, understanding, you know, challenging effectively, um, is this status quo the right the right thing? Um, what, what may feel normalized may not actually be, um, uh, may not be, you know, may not appear to be a problem when really it is a problem and it's just industry-wide um, and, and needs to be fixed. Um, and, and then, yeah, there was a whole conversation around mental health and all that kind of stuff, which which was an interesting, but probably a different conversation than the, the conversation here. Um, but absolutely, I think trying to um, understand how value is aligned um, and, and questioning that is, is a scary, but very important conversation to be had. Yeah. Yeah. We don't, we don't like to be... Lawyer, generally speaking, lawyers don't like to be measured. Um, sorry, they do like to be measured, but using their own metrics, right? Mm. So it's kind of like almost like ticking your own report card. But I mean, I challenge you, any any lawyers out there listening to this, 
to what extent are you are you allowing your business to mark your report card and if you're not why not and if you are what are they measuring and then mm. figure out what they are measuring are you doing that most effectively and how do you improve that it's probably automation to some extent yeah awesome Okay, so what I want to do now is kind of narrow the conversation again into sort of, you know, we've talked a lot about, uh, you know, why business cases are important, how to effectively calculate and conceptualize and even um, frame benefits. Um, but what I want to do is kind of get a little bit tactical for a moment. Want, don't want to spend too long on this, but I'm sure when people uh, after this session come out of this, they're like, cool, um, I want to build a business case, but how does one even look like? So I want to quickly kind of um, cover the typical kind of structural elements of a business case as well. And I'll, I'll go and share my screen to do that. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of like a very expansive um, version, I would say, of a, of a business case. There's elements that you can definitely you know, add and take out. Um, but I like to think of it as really these eight sort of elements here are going from executive summary at the top there, framing the problem statement, you know, what does it look like today? What does it look like in the future? Obviously the, the solution that helps us solve the problem in number two. And then number four is an interesting one because number four is around sort of progress so far in, in, in sort of the, the, the thinking. That can be from, uh, you know, internal um, interviews and conversations with stakeholders, or it can be as far as POCs and trials with vendors, right? And I think it's back to the point we were making before, you know, a business case is really just a way to show, you know, due diligence and collective thinking and, a, and an organizational decision. Um, as opposed to individual uh, single person really running running the charge here. And I think four really also does, if, 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 you know, if done right, can be quite compelling as well. Um, five is really moving into implementation plan. So, you know, thinking not just about what have we done to date, but how do we actually get to where we need to in the future? Um, and that's a combination of timeline and milestones and resources and people. And then number six is, of course, what we've spent most of this session talking about really conceptualizing the ROI metrics and the payback period. Um, I think you were mentioning before, Alex, you know, that the ROI tends to ramp up, right? And there's a bit of a spike in the cost of investment at the beginning. And hopefully you have this kind of like intersecting uh, curve that go in opposite directions um, and you get a lot back in sort of year two, year three. Um, seven is around risks, right? What are the risks that we've identified and how are we addressing them or how are we going to address them? And then finally, the recommendation. And so if you can imagine this as being, you know, uh, in a, say, a PowerPoint deck where you have these eight elements all mapped out, it's a pretty compelling uh, sort of story um, for, for people who may not have been part of the journey uh, to actually, you know, be brought on board with, with whatever sort of initiative you're driving. Um, and, I, and I did mention, like, these are, these are not necessarily the must-haves, right? Like, this is a pretty heavyweight business case. And I would say if I were to pick you know, the, the ones that I would say are critical, it's it pretty much, much be, you know, you can have a business case that's just these four elements, you know, exact summary, problem statement, the solution, the ROI um, as well. Hmm. Um, do you have anything just, to add just to that? On, Yeah. Yeah, just um, if, if you haven't seen the Uber pitch deck, Google it and look at okay. it. It's actually so cool. Um, it covers most of all those things, but it's just so simple. I think a lot of a lot of what we do is is try to overcomplicate things to some extent. And because we're asking mm. to buy a lot of money or this is a really significant thing, you really want to overcomplicate it. But the reality it is, if, if it's too complicated, it's it's hard for anyone to make a decision on. And mm. you know, if you need to bury your, I don't know, return investment under a lot of information or your solution's really complicated, then it's just not going to land as much. So just look at the Uber pitch deck and it's 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 so simple and it's um quite refreshing. So maybe just consider that awesome yeah no i've never heard of that so i'll definitely check that out after this uh after this session um and in fact there's uh, uh there's another sort of resource that um i'm gonna shamelessly plug as well which is we we have a business case templated checkbox as well um and so that that kind of helps you walk through and i guess the 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 thing as well is you know you've got generic business cases and there'll be templates all over the place and um as you mentioned there's there's ways to tell stories right and 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 then create compelling business decisions like, like the Uber pitch deck. Um, but there's nuances as well that tend to be quite helpful within automation and um, within um, the framing of legal, right? Um, just to show you an example, right? If uh, Let's see if I can jump to the other PowerPoint here. 
to show you an example, right? Like there's elements like, uh, if I show this slide here, you can do, I, I think you mentioned this before, it's like kind of the business impact, right? You have kind of like your challenges to overcome, your, your impacts on the business and then the solution itself. And just even on a page, being able to frame exactly what the challenges are, but also what the impact on the business is, right? Like to, today, you and I were talking a lot about, you know, whilst the legal team is buried in low risk and high volume tasks and, and have a slow turnaround time, what is the impact on the business, right? It, it becomes a bottleneck for the execution of key transactions and this slows down the, the business's ability to achieve key objectives. And then it's like, how do we solve that, right? Um, and this, even this simple kind of framework can, can go a long way for people who may never have built a business case in the past and, and can kind of use this as a, a bit of a, um, a bit of a guide. Uh, you can, you can steal as much as, <laughs> as, as you need, but it's, it's pretty much, you know, just walking through those. And, and another really interesting thing, um, last kind of slide I want to show here is we talked about before as to how automation typically isn't just one use case. It's a combination of many different use cases. So even being able to spell out what that looks like in the business case, um, you know, use case one, use case two, the perhaps the expected ROI for each of those, and therefore the combined ROI of the whole entire um, movement um, can be quite helpful. Um, awesome. I think it's a, it's a great resource. Um, I think if you're thinking about the capability that Checkbox brings, it, it needs to be anchoring itself in a in a the biggest use case. You have to have an mm. anchor because uh, it, it's hard to say we really want to have um, an automation automation solution that's going to allow us to build X Y Z. And the obvious question is, well, what is X Y Z? And if you don't have that answer, then it's not going to fly. So you need to have at least one, two better, three is probably the best anchor use cases. And each of those will effectively have their own return on investment calculations as well. Not as in-depth as the overall application ROI, but you know, mm. an example of how much benefit each of those apps are going to bring. Absolutely. And, and the last thing I want to kind of touch on actually before, before we kind of um, open up for questions. And by the way, for those of you listening live at the moment, if you do have any questions, please go and pump them into the um, Q&A box at the bottom. We can address them at the end. Um, but the last thing I definitely want to cover is... Uh, really objection handling or common pushbacks to business cases. Um, because I feel like, you know, whilst people can go through this exercise, there's already so much cultural resistance to technology being adopted. Um, and, and that often can stop the movement altogether at the beginning. So have you come across any sort of tips um, that you would be able to share around? Um, what if people come and say, well, we've already got this, we've already got a tool internally that does this or, yeah. Um, we don't have budget for this. Um, we don't have time for this. How do you typically, you know, get past that initial gate to even begin the conversation? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, the common, common ones I come across uh, specific to automation are things like, um, it sounds cool, but not now. It's not a focus right now. So we'll kick it down the road, which is really just procrastination. Mm. Um, we don't have the budget. I'll come back through all of these and I'll explain a bit more, but we don't have budget. Um, it's kind of too complicated. And then the one that you mentioned, which was we've already got a tool that, um, that kind of addresses this. So if I kind of go backwards now, the, the objection to um, we already have a tool that does this is a valid objection. And you actually have to be able to demonstrate that that tool that they currently has isn't going to meet your requirements. Now, you can fall in love with technology, especially like Checkbox because it's sick, but you need to be able to think, does the technology that we currently have meet our requirements and you know if you've got someone objective like say it who has who has raised this objection then you have to really hear them out and make sure that you have ticked that box to say mm. no it doesn't meet the requirements and here's why mm. you also need to think of that as a bit of a spectrum it's not binary it's not it does meet the requirement it doesn't meet the requirement the way in which i've really um helped clients get through this specific objection is you can communicate that whilst the technology that we currently have meets the requirements it only meets 30 percent of our requirements and you know checkbox would be able to reach 80 percent of our requirements or 100 percent of our requirements so you're agreeing with that objection and saying yes there is technology enterprise technology that would, would, would allow us to do part of it but it's only 20 percent and therefore you know our return on investment is going to be different um, and the benefit is going to be drastically reduced now what we're looking for is something that is you know x whatever it is checkbox and it's going to meet 100% of that um, of that of those requirements, and that's kind of how I would probably object to that. And the no budget objection is, um, <laughs> I mean, it could be pretty obvious that there is no budget, um, but I think 
often what what people mean when there's no budget is I don't fully know how to understand. I don't fully understand how to communicate or change the, the ROI calculation. Because mm. if you're thinking of automation as on top of your budget, in which case, you know, that's hard to justify. But if it's actually we can fit this in our current budget by moving things around by, let's say, reducing headcount or uh, reducing your external spend or whatever it may be, then you can kind of get it across the line. Again, you just have to be really creative in shifting around numbers. Now, most legal teams have a bucket of money or multiple buckets of money, and you need to understand how they all work. In some organizations, there is just a bucket of money for legal fees and that can only be used for legal fees, in which case you can't use that money for, for um, software. There could be other ones where there is a, a very small bucket for IT spend, for instance, and you would have to try build a business case to expand that bucket or that bucket is just fixed, in which case you have to talk to tech. So again, it's, it's being obsessed with understanding what the game is and understanding where that money can kind of come from. But in my mind, the no budget conversation is a response to I don't fully understand the return on investment yet because if you're coming to them asking for money with no return of course they're going to say no <laughs> but if you can say I can give you five dollars back for every dollar you spend you invest in me of course I'm going to do it I'm going to get a get out of bed for that and then uh, what was the other objection I can't remember I named four they're probably the main two ones that are yeah, probably the most I important agree. ones to be thinking about absolutely um, and and I have things to add to that, but given the, the time, and I, we do have a question, so I'm going to rather uh, uh, prioritize the question here. It's a question from um, uh, David who says, do you guys do any benefits realization to measure Ooh. against the business case post-release? So, you know, he, he, he's calling out, it's particularly difficult, right, for an in-house team that doesn't do anything in terms of time recording. So, you know, is, is there sort of the measure of the ROI post the implementation? Mm -hmm. It's a really good question, David. So what are your thoughts, Alex? Yeah, it's a good question. I actually wrote, it, wrote a note down to, to talk about that right at the start when we talked about the business case. The, the other reason why you're creating a business case, actually, I think I did mention it. The reason why you're creating the business case is to effectively create, create your baseline and then create what you're projecting to say. Now, obviously, you need to check yourself against that. <laughs> if you are looking at a process that, you know, in the example that we had before, it was three hours, then it was down to 0.5. So we're not reducing it by 100%. We're reducing it by whatever that percentage is, 70%. Mm -hmm. Did you actually do that? And did you do it in month one, month two, month three, or is it year one, year two, year three? I'm actually checking yourself again. There. So yeah, it's, it's a really good question, David. And I think your benefits realization will effectively mirror your business case. Um, now, in reality, there's probably going to be things that you underestimated, overestimated, or things that you just didn't even consider. So unintended consequences, positive and negative. And I think it's about doing those. I think. Again, in reality, looking back to some of the examples I've had, once capital is deployed, it's not really important to be able to justify your return on investment until, in our case, that software license is up for renewal. Mm. So if you can be strategic, and I would always suggest for any kind of technology implementation to try to have at least a two or three year license fee. Now, some of the software providers might not like that <laughs> because their product is changing each year and their software licenses might get you know, stuck on a certain price. But I think it becomes less relevant during the capital that's already been deployed. And it becomes very important for when you need to renew that. So a lot of people will become complacent during the, let's call it a three-year period and say, yep, this is all going good. All of a sudden tech go, okay, well, the license now is 25% more expensive with three years long. Um, you know, did we get the return on investment that we did? And unless you've got that framework in place or you actually capture that information, and by no means am I suggesting time recording. Like I said, there's other ways in which you can measure relative effort. Um, then you might be stuck. So great question. Mm, absolutely. Great. And we're just on time now. So I'll, I'll just show this final slide here, which is really, um, if you enjoyed the conversation, if you want to learn more, here are the contact details for myself um, and for Alex. Feel free to reach out to us via email or LinkedIn. Um, and the business case template that you saw before, you can get that at uh, checkbox.ai forward slash resources. Uh, there's other templates there as well. Um, thank you so much, Alex. That was a pleasure um, chatting with you. Um, and hopefully this was more than 200% ROI for the people who have tuned in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Evan. It was great. Thanks, Evan and Alex. Really appreciate the session. Great session, by the way. And lots for people to take away and unpack. So I'm sure that they will be. Uh, contacting you afterwards. Um, thanks everyone also for attending. Uh, this is, as we said at the outset, episode four. There's a few more to come. If you want to go back and check 
uh, and catch up on the other episodes, uh, please do. You'll find them on our website. And of course, uh, feel free to follow us, all of us probably for that matter, uh, on LinkedIn, uh, Facebook and Twitter. So thanks very much, folks. The next session in this episode five will be how to choose the right solution. And, and you can see how these are kind of building from one to the next episode. That'll be with Jean Turner from Lawhawk. So do tune in with us again on the 1st of October uh, for episode five. But for now, again, Alex, Evan, thank you so much. Fabulous session. And to everyone else, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Sarah.